A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia, and we are recording this on June 16th of 2021. Our guest today is Stephen Lee, a former federal prosecutor and a current trial lawyer and litigator. Stephen, welcome to the program. Thanks, Anna. Glad to be here. We're thrilled you're here because you've got some expertise and background from your prosecuting days and also as um, a defense attorney. I I realize that, Stephen, you don't necessarily work on murder cases, but the fraud and the health care cases that you have worked and continue to work, give me an idea of the, the, the complexities of how that may have some implications on one of the cases we're going to look at as far as paper trails. Well, I think for this case in particular, uh, the first one we're going to talk about, there's it's, it's a murder case, but there's a huge financial component to this case. It seems like that was the motive for the case. And it seems like the investigators did a lot of work to reconstruct finances. And so that's kind of what led to helping them determine the motive and opportunity for the crime. Um, okay. So that kind of fits in. Those are the kinds of things that fit in with other, you know, I usually deal with more complicated healthcare fraud where people are, you know, uh, defrauding insurance companies or Medicare. So generally in those kind of cases, you're not trying to kill the victim. You're just trying to rob their insurer. Um, so, so that's, a, that's why it's a little different, very different from my typical case, but the financial aspects and some of the basic tools that, the, that they used in solving this case, I think those are similar. I mean, one of the things that's very interesting about the, what happened in the first case we're going to talk about is that the defendant, uh, just talked to the police, you know, multiple times and gave inconsistent statements. You know, that's the kind of thing that's a huge red flag uh, for any kind of complex uh, criminal case. And that's the kind of thing that could really hurt someone like it did right. in her case. Absolutely. OK, so let's let's give everyone a preview of what we're going to talk about on this episode. One of our cases, a Virginia Tech linebacker allegedly murdered a man who catfished him on Tinder by pretending to be a woman. It is just tragic across the board. But first, this is the case where I can't wait to hear your expertise, Stephen. A woman in Wisconsin allegedly poisoned a friend with eye drops and then staged the scene to look like a suicide so she could steal $300,000 from the victim. As you were saying, Stephen, most of the cases that you work on, no one's trying to kill anyone. They're just trying to trying to steal money. This one has two layers and two components, murder and theft. Right. And also, I know that um, in the area in which you worked in as a prosecutor and also as an attorney, you tend to work with much higher level and better skilled um, fraudsters, I would say. This one, I I think the fact that she did this in the most uh, basic way, if you will, really left the breadcrumbs for the police to ultimately find her. So let's get into the details of the case. On June 4th, prosecutors charged 37-year-old Jesse Krzyzewski with first-degree intentional homicide and two counts of theft. Now, according to the criminal complaint, Jesse called police on October 3rd of 2018, that's how far back we're going, to report that her friend was unconscious and not breathing. Now, at the scene, police find this woman right? The woman that they called for, the victim here, unconscious in a recliner. And this is the part that is really suspicious. They say that they found a large amount of crushed medications on her chest, right? How how bizarre is that? And then there was a plate directly to her left, also with a large amount of what appeared to be crushed up medications. So initially, police looked at this as a potential suicide. And Stephen, I know we see this a lot, that when police get to the scene of a crime, sometimes things look one way, but really they're another. And it's not until you get the rest of the forensics in that you can really decide what was the cause of death. And this one is so fascinating because of that. Um, Do you always find, Stephen, that how people act in the first 
you know, 48 hours of a case and what they say or don't say to police starts raising the red flags? Yeah, it does happen a lot. And it's people, I think sometimes people think that they can get away with it if they just get through those first 24, 48 hours. But these cases go on for a long time. These cases, uh, there's no statute of limitations on murder. So, I mean, that's why you see cases being, you say this happened in 2018 and she's just being charged now. Two years is not necessarily a long time. I mean, there are murder cases that take years to investigate and that's that's totally fine and appropriate when necessary. So here, I think she, it sounds like, based on what I read and heard, that, you know, she, she, staged, she staged the scene in a way to make it look like a suicide. And that's what the statements she made to the police at the time were in that vein. But as more evidence came out, as more information came through, as the police started seeing the things she did after that initial 24, 48 hours when she probably thought she got away with it, that's when more and more pieces came together for the government. It's fascinating how people think they can get away with these things, how they think that they're so much smarter than everyone and and go through the process of planning, staging, getting their stories together when the entire time it's like they're covered in red flags. Every time they open their mouth, every time they say something, they do something, it's like another red flag that's literally popping out. And I, I see this in this particular case because, you know, the 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 woman who called 911 said, well, you know what? My friend was despondent. She was very ill. She'd been in the hospital for a long time. I think that's why she took her own life. So she starts setting the stage of what was going on in this person's life, which helps to fill in the gaps. Now, what's very interesting here, even though this was initially looked at as a potential drug overdose, the victim in the case has not been named in court, which I find very weird given that this is a three-year-old case. She's being referred to in the court case, in documents, as victim A. Stephen, is that weird not to name the victim? It's a little odd. Uh, Usually in a murder case, you're going to have the name of the defendant and the name of the victim are going to be part of the public record. Um, just that's kind of typical. Um, Here, I'm not sure exactly why that's the case. It might be because there's the financial component to this case. It does sound like there's some elements here that could relate to potential identity theft. Um, In identity theft cases, it's pretty typical to keep the name of the victim private because you don't want, the government does not want to further compound the identity theft by putting the victim's name out there. So I'm not sure uh, if that's the reason, but that might explain why the victim's name is not being disclosed. In this it's, way. it's it's very curious to us now. However, ABC News has named the victim a 62 year old Lynn Hernan of Pewaukee, described in her obituary as a hairstylist who owned her own salon. And also, uh, neighbors and friends and family of the victim have been talking, obviously not only with investigators but with the media, painting a different picture, saying, you know, it's it's very weird that. Once Jesse, you know, who is half her age almost, came into the victim's world, that the victim became more isolated. We see that a lot, especially with uh, fraud cases where we see the person trying to limit the exposure to friends and family because this, this has a much more complicated component where when the victim passed away, it was Jesse who inherited everything. And family and friends were like, why, what? That doesn't make any sense. Who is this woman? And why would Lynn leave all her money to her? Which of course, authorities believe she did not. Do you see that a lot in in fraud cases where it's that beginning of the isolation and then the trying to either get the person to switch their documents or I guess forge them? Well, I think in fraud cases in general, a big part of the fraud is kind of creating this kind of alternate reality, right? You want to have the the reality that you're controlling and that benefits you. Uh, and then there's the real world. And so the more you can do to kind of isolate people and to keep them from getting kind of the outside influence and things like that, the, the more successful fraud will work. Um, I mean, that's a big part of kind of uh, when I was a prosecutor, a big part of that's a big part of what we do. You would try to find a way to pin that bubble that people have tried to create in terms of the fraud that they're maintaining. So that seems like be what she was trying to do here. 
Yeah, it does. It does. So here's um, what's interesting also about the statements that Jesse made early on. She said that um, and she clearly had keys to the victim's house. She told police again that her friend had been recently released from the hospital, but in the last week had been acting oddly, setting the stage, painting a picture and the narrative that obviously the woman took her own life. The other thing that Jesse said was, well, Lynn told me where all her documents were. She gave me instructions about what to do with the cats in case she passed away. She said, I don't want to go to a nursing home if I become very ill. And then, and of course she said, my friend was very suicidal. So the narrative has been painted for the authorities. Three months later, everything changes in this case, right? In the meantime, friends and family are saying, this is very bizarre. This is not right. Our friend, our relative, our niece, she did not want to kill herself. And then the toxicology reports come back. And that's when the sheriffs reopen the case, or I would say redirect the case, because I don't, I don't believe the case was ever really closed. I think they redirect the case toward murder because the toxicology test showed that the victim had a fatal, fatal amount of tetrahydrosoline, which is the main ingredient in eye drops in her system. So when investigators told Jesse, Jesse, did you know that Lynn had so much, we could say, visine or eye drops in her system? Jesse changes her story. Three months later, she says, you know what? That's how she was trying to kill herself <laughs> with, with the eye drops, that that's exactly what she was trying to do when she staged her suicide. So, you know, and the other thing is that in, in the process, the authorities discovered that Jesse had the power of attorney as well. So what in the world is going on with this obsession with eye drops? This is about the third case we've done here on the program in recent months where the victim has been killed with an excessive amount of eye drops. It's like, it's, it's like the method of killing right now. Well, first of all, um, it, it does seem like there are, it, it's, I think the thing about eye drops that makes it attractive, I would think as a murder weapon is the idea that you can just, you can get it right. If you can get it, it's relatively easy. It's, it's not hard to get and that you can actually, there's opportunity. So there's that. I will say that in general, you know, any kind of poison is pretty rare actually as a terms of a murder weapon. Um, the FBI actually tracks this. Uh, every year they put out statistics showing kind of like all the murders that took place over the course of the year. And they actually do track kind of the murder weapons uh, over time. And so poison in general is used about maybe about 10 times a year in terms of murders, at least up through 20, like through like 2014 through 2019. Uh, we don't have statistics, so maybe that spiked a lot in 2020, uh, but it is relatively rare. Firearms are far more common uh, in terms of in terms of the murder weapon. But I think here, I think it's the opportunity, right? I think it's just it's easy to get a hold of eye drops. And so if you're going to try poisoning someone, that's something that you can that's something it just it's it's not difficult to get a hold of, whereas it would be difficult to get a hold of other types of murder weapons. And what we've seen with the use of eye drops to kill someone is we've seen a variety of ways that killers have used it. We've seen them use it in small increments that increase that cause all forms of illnesses and debilitates the person, <clears throat> excuse me, over a period of time. Then we see those who just like slam it and give a fatal dose to kill the person. So it's very fascinating to see how people have been using it. There's there, the, these cases, I'm telling you, it's just, I realize it's not as uh, prevalent as other ways of killing, but I am seeing in my own personal statistical evaluation, <laughs> I'm seeing an uptick in the use of uh, eye drops as murder. <laughs> All right. Well, for, yeah, I think it may be this particular type of murder, right? Because yeah. Obviously, a lot of firearm cases we see involve very different types of circumstances. But for something like this, where someone's maybe let's say planning something over time and doesn't necessarily have the same kind of violent, you know, criminal history, yeah, eye drops. I think you know, yeah, it, it it does kind of it's a it's an interesting, easy weapon of choice. I think mm -hmm. it feels more passive. I think you know, I I just think 
You know, you don't imagine just even because when we see fits of rage, which we're going to see in our next case where anger takes over and it's a very violent death and assault with this, I feel it's such a passive little, oh, here's another drop. Oh, here's another right. drop, right? I, as the killer, could do that as opposed to finding that rage within me. It's just such a different different way of killing someone. So let's get back to some of these crazy facts, or shall I say stories. Jessie kept changing her story. Like at one point, she even told the cops that the victim, Lynn, had been in a coma for five months. Well, they checked her story and that wasn't true. There were so many things that were, that were being revealed to be not true. True. So on July 9th of 2019, so think about halfway through the investigation, a year after the murder, investigators served a search warrant on Jesse's home. And then she was arrested, um, which is very interesting. Jesse says that she is innocent of all of this. She says she never, ever um, did anything like this, that she says that it was the victim who staged her own suicide, not her. And then she started changing her stories again, saying, you know what? I actually saw Lynn drink Visine with her vodka before she died. So at that point, I think she's taking the evidence that's building against her and then using it in her new story. You know what? She always liked you know, a Visine chaser with her vodka. Give me a break. <laughs> That's insane. Yeah, I mean, that was a huge, it's a huge mistake to, if you're going to talk to the government, uh, which is a big decision in any kind of criminal case, do it, do it once. Do it once, get everything out on the table and be completely truthful as much as you can. Because the worst thing is to talk to the government once and then come back and change your story and then change a story and so on. Because all of those changes give the government uh, plenty of opportunities to fact check you and to show that you're a liar. Um, and it, it can really create strong evidence when there might not be as much to begin with. But every change she made to the story just undercut her credibility, showed she was a liar, and gave the government really good evidence that she had committed the murder to begin with, at least according to what's in the public documents. So, Stephen, are you saying that if Jesse had not said anything other than to say she was despondent and ill, I don't know anything else, that even when they found the fatal dose of the eye drops in the toxicology reports, that there may not have been any way of linking her, this is separate of the financial fraud, to this? It's, it's the fact that she kept saying all these crazy things that made the government look that much harder and deeper? Well, I think at the beginning, if the first conversation she had, again, according to the public documents, you know, kind of she acknowledged some things. It was kind of vague. Her story was pretty vague. So there are things in that story that might not have been true, but they're easy to say, oh, it was a mistake. I didn't really, you know, I, I, I didn't really say it properly. But later on, when she was confronted with evidence, when she made the, when she made, according to the documents, the admission that, oh, I knew that there was Visine in the water bottle. That's huge. That contradicts everything, she, everything she said the first time and is really inconsistent with what she said the first time. So, one, it, it's, it raises huge suspicions and red flags about her. And second of all, it eliminates her ability to argue later on, you know, certain defenses that she might have had available if she had just said nothing. Um, so, for example, a lot of times um, now, Given everything that was coming out from the toxicology, given all the friends and family who were talking to the government, talking to police, you know, after, you know, in the ensuing months, it sounds like the police probably would have kept investigating. It sounds like the police probably would have a good case. But they, if she hadn't talked to the police, the police wouldn't have this huge set of inconsistencies and lies that she said that really shows powerful evidence. If she hadn't talked to to the police, then if she's arrested, her lawyer could have argued things to the jury and maybe they will still try. Um, you know, it, the, her lawyer might have had more opportunity to say, well, sure, okay, sure, there's this thing, but how can you prove that, you know, that Jesse's connected to the Visine, right? Right. How right. can you prove, how can you be sure that Jesse knew all these things? Well, 
by talking to the police, Jesse pretty much connected a lot of the dots for the police and for a future jury herself, right. which again, makes it much harder for her to have any wiggle room at this point, again, and, based on the public documents. Right. And you referred to that water bottle and, and she told police, this would have been a few days after the search warrant, she told police that on the day of Lynn's death, that she gave Lynn a water bottle with six Visine bottles because she asked for it. Then, then she comes up with this crazy statement that actually um, she buried the Visine and the water bottle in the backyard, which was also not true. Now, this part is fascinating, whether true or not. I always find um, the statements made by jail cell prison mates always always a little suspicious because there's always something in there for them <laughs> but nonetheless she allegedly told a cellmate at Tachita Correctional Facility which by the way is in Fond du Lac Wisconsin and I have been there many many times there aren't a lot of prisons that I have visited many many times <laughs> <laughs> this one I'm a regular okay. at. <laughs> Not because I've done anything. I just visit people there. <laughs> um, that is an aside, but nonetheless, I think always an interesting one. Um, so apparently she told a cellmate there that she slipped the victim several bottles of Visine to kill her because she was trying to stop her friend's suffering, which is, again, Another variation on the story she's been telling. I don't know how valuable are those kinds of statements when being used against someone, because usually there's something in it for the, you know, for the person who's the snitch on the inside. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the police and juries are, should, are, and should be skeptical of these kind of like confessions to fellow inmates. Um, there, there's huge, you know, one of the big things that comes up in any kind of trial is whether a witness has a reason to lie, whether there's re reasons to question their credibility. Uh, inmates coming forward saying that someone told them something, yeah, they're trying, a lot of times they're trying to get a deal from the government, they're trying to get leniency in their own case. So it is right to be skeptical of what people say. What's interesting about that statement, um, the way you recounted it, is it could be a way, and again, you know, obviously we don't know how this is all going to play out, but sometimes what happens is, um, you know, especially if Jesse's thinking like, okay, you know, I'm caught and it's a, it's a murder case and I'm looking at really serious penalties. Maybe there's things I can do to at least soften the blow, maybe to at least mitigate the penalty that's going to be imposed down the road, something like that trying to come up with some other reason. Well, sure, I did something wrong, but I had a, I had a somewhat decent reason for it. Um, those are the kind of things that perhaps, you know, we do see this some, sometimes where people start trying to position themselves that way. Um, so there might be some aspect to that statement, um, you know, trying to get the idea, well, I did it, but there was a reason. Again, hard to know the credibility of all that, but that could be some of the thinking. So we've discussed the crime itself, the murder. Now let's talk about the financial fraud that's involved here. Court records say that not long after our victim died, that Jesse, who inherited everything, started spending an awful lot more money. She started doing lavish spa treatments for herself and her girlfriends. She went gambling at casinos and... There, there was also, there's an allegation that's part of the complaint that she began transferring funds to her own account and doing it in a manner that is fraudulent. Um, apparently, she managed to transfer more than $130,000 via fraudulent checks. And that I think is going to be maybe where the heart of this is because she could make the argument she was the beneficiary. However, she may not be the legitimate beneficiary of the woman's estate, right? That that may not be part of it. So this is, I think, where she started to get, once again, sloppy, really sloppy, because I would think that's the easiest part 
of this case, or I could be wrong, the financial fraud part here. Yeah, well, the financial fraud aspect is really important because it just helps establish the motive for the crime. It also uh, further undercuts any kind of credibility she has for her statements. Uh, it makes it very difficult for her to, let's say, get up in front of the jury and testify because even putting aside the murder, there's all these re- all these instances, both in this case and according to the complaint, you know, previous crimes where she was engaged in financial shenanigans, uh, where she lied. So those are things that a prosecutor can and would use to undercut her credibility massively if she took the stand. Uh, it also, it could be, you know, depending on the crimes, um, some of that earlier conduct might even be admissible in the trial if there ever is one. Um, a lot of times courts are careful to make sure juries really evaluate a person based on the crime that they're charged with here and now. And don't, just because they committed crimes in the past, that doesn't use, a lot of times that doesn't come into evidence. Um, but if you can, if the government can show kind of a pattern of using deceit, if they can show things that are similar, those are reasons why past crimes can come into evidence as well. But yeah, I think the, the financial aspect of this case really establishes a strong motive um, and it does establish further undercuts her credibility in significant ways, which will make it difficult for her to, um, you know, go to trial if she were to choose to do so. So, of course, Jesse maintains her innocence. She is charged with first degree intentional homicide. Jesse also faces two felony counts of theft. That would be all the financial fraud. Her bond was set at one million dollars. Her preliminary hearing is scheduled for June 25th. And it should be interesting to see how the story changes as the case evolves. Before we move on to our next case, here's a quick word from our sponsor. Finding a new home that fits your family's needs can be tricky. You want room to spread out, space to gather, and a place to get away from it all. Luckily, when you need a mortgage that fits your family's needs, you go to Rocket Mortgage. With Rocket Mortgage, you can see your loan options, closing costs, tax estimates, and more all online in real time to get the full picture before anything is finalized. You can plan with certainty knowing you have a mortgage solution that works for your family. Visit rocketmortgage.com slash true crime daily because when you need a mortgage that fits your life, Rocket can. Call for cost information and conditions, equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, and mlsconsumeraccess.org number 3030. Our next case is very disturbing. An 18-year-old linebacker for the Virginia Tech football team is accused of punching and killing a 40-year-old man who allegedly posed as a woman on Tinder. The medical examiner said that every bone in the victim's face was smashed. This was a very violent attack. Ismeme Etute told cops, this is a football player, that when he went to the apartment of a woman he believed to be named Angie, this is someone that he had met on Tinder. So apparently Ismeme went to the apartment on April 10th and he went to be there with Angie so Angie could perform oral sex on him. This is as reported by the Roanoke Times. Then Ismeme returned to the apartment on May 31st for another hookup. And that's when he says that he discovered that Angie was really a man. This is according to the prosecutor. And the defense attorney supports this version of events. Angie was really 40-year-old Jerry Smith, who worked in a restaurant, according to the New York Post. Ismeme admitted to police that he punched Jerry five times in the face and then he stomped on him. Remember, Ismeme is an athlete a football player in college. He said that as he left the apartment, he could hear bubbling and gurgling coming from Jerry's body. He did not call police. He did not call 911. He did not call anyone to help Jerry. And then on June 1st, that's when cops found Jerry's badly beaten body. The autopsy shows that Jerry died of blunt force trauma to the head. He was missing all his teeth. All the bones in his face were crushed. 
And now Ismeme is facing second degree murder charges. I, I, this is such a violent case. Um, why do you think it's second degree as opposed to first degree murder on the charge here? Yeah, well, that goes to kind of the differences in how the law classifies killings. I think um, there's actually a distinction between a killing and a homicide and a murder and different types of murder. And a lot of that goes to the, the what was in the person's head at the time of the killing. So clearly, and obviously this is a very sad case, obviously he's acknowledged that he, that he killed this man, um, but a big part now goes to what was he thinking at the time that he did it? He's not disputing he killed the man. It's all, it largely seems to be going on what was in his head. Mm-hmm. Now, first degree murder, in, in, it varies by state. So, and every state does it a little bit differently. Uh, But in Virginia, first degree murder, that requires a killing that can also, it also involves willful, deliberate, and premeditation. So that's the element here that would be, that's the element here that the government would have to show in order to show first degree murder in Virginia, as opposed to every other kind of murder, which would be second degree. Mm -hmm. So here, this seems to be, again, from from what's been reported, this seems to be kind of a what I think people would what I think that his defense attorney would say a heat of the moment action, you know, kind of something. It wasn't planned. It was kind of like a terrible reaction to what he learned. And as opposed to that kind of instant reaction, as opposed to something he planned to do. And right. so if that's the case, I think that's where and it seems to be given the circumstances and given what's been reported, that seems to be. Uh, if you accept that, then second degree murder kind of makes sense. It doesn't necessarily involve kind of the, the heinousness of the crime or what happened. It's all about just what was in the defendant's mind at the time that the killing happened. So that's why it's first degree versus second degree. Okay. So it doesn't appear that it was premeditated. It appears this was more heat of passion reaction, um, the rage that came out for this revelation. Now, I have to tell you, that, and I'm probably not the only one who's wondering, what did Ismeme know or not know about Jerry slash Angie? Because he's saying, because he went back to the apartment a second time. If you had told me that this happened on the first encounter, Perhaps then the revelation might have seemed as shocking. I'm not saying that it's not a shocking revelation, depending on on where you are. But I find it interesting that he went back a second time and that it was in that encounter that he claims to have discovered this as if that's the reason and the excuse for the murder. And we only have what he's saying at this point to back that up. I'm sure that the police are doing all the forensics on the phones, the Tinder accounts, everything to figure out what was the communication between the victim and the suspect, because that will perhaps tell us whether Ismeme knew or didn't know if he was a man. And the reason I'm bringing that up, Stephen, is because of what the defense attorney is already putting out in the public record. As you said, You know, he's not disputing that he killed Jerry. He's explaining what happened. And the defense attorney is framing it in a way that he's trying to convince the public that it's still horrible, but maybe you would understand if this happened to you. I don't want to put words in the attorney. That's why we're going to let him speak for himself. So Here's what's happened so far. During the hearing, his attorney, Ismami's attorney, Jimmy Turk, argued that the case was, quote, more than someone just showing up to an apartment and punching someone. Okay, so he's already setting it up not only with the judge, because all of this went towards setting up bail and other conditions, but also the public record. The attorney added, quote, nobody deserves to die, but I don't mind saying don't pretend you are something you are not. When I hear this, Stephen, I feel like that's blaming the victim, as if the victim caused this situation. There is an aspect of that. And that's why the defense attorney is trying to walk the line or going to need to walk the line carefully. 
Um, because there are circumstances here that are, you know, very odd. And there's circumstances here that could, you know, could put the crime in some context, but that can also backfire. Um, and so, and, and, and you want to be careful when dealing with that kind of situation. Um, Absolutely. But I think here, um, I think there are going to the larger point. I think there's things like a lot's going to probably come out. And I think the government may well have already have a lot of this information. And that might be why uh, they charge the case in the way that they've already done. And um, because, again, you mentioned that the government's probably going to do forensics. Uh, they probably are. Uh, but they might already have done a lot of that pretty early on, especially if he consented to, let's say, because it's one thing if you say you, it's one thing for the government to search someone's phone. It, it can take a while to do it. It's another thing if he provided consent, you know, immediately and to say, hey, you can look at that because, you know, obviously, as I think we all kind of know or appreciate, you know, there's a huge electronic trail now to the things we do, uh, the text messages we send, the things we post online. A lot of that exists. Um, a lot of that can, and a lot of that's very, you know, time stamped, and we can see things, and and it's very, you know, and the government can go back to a lot of our service providers and get additional detail about exactly, you know, where, you know, when you sent something, and even sometimes where you were when you sent something. So in this case, I, I think probably if um, the government may well have already reviewed some of that material. Um, if everything is as the defense attorney saying, the defense attorney and the defendant may well have turned over some of that information up front so the government can, can understand that. Um, I do think in a lot of these cases, um, sometimes it, it is helpful to remember that things that seem really obvious in, to us in hindsight aren't as obvious to the people living through the circumstances. Right. That's very possible. So here is more from the defense attorney. This clip is courtesy of WDBJ TV. This is, you know, just one of those dangerous circumstances where, you know, the technology that we have today gives people an opportunity to to really create some very dangerous circumstances. You know, again, Stephen, I feel like this statement is going a little bit toward victim blaming um, it's always what you choose to do in a situation when you are faced with what's going on. Um, you know, he's kind of almost suggesting that the client, meaning his client, Ismeme, was lured to the apartment. I'm having a real hard time with believing he was lured to the apartment. He went there to be satisfied, was satisfied the first time, then he went back a second time. So I, I can't say that this is a trap or a lure. I think he knew exactly what he was going there for, for a hookup. I, I, I get that. Whether he knew or didn't know that Angie was really a man, I don't know. I find this part curious, Stephen. Do you think that there's any wiggle room here or any consideration to be given to the potential of a hate crime, that the reaction was so violent and severe when Ismeme realized that Angie was a man? Would that be something that would go into consideration here or that, or this doesn't fit that? Well, in terms of uh, hate crimes vary quite widely by state and by the federal in the in terms of the federal system. Um, and so but one aspect of a hate crime in terms of prosecuting a hate crime, one thing the government has to take on is proving that someone, you know, basically targeted someone because of some protected status whether like their it's sexual sexuality. orientation right. or race or something like that. That is adding um, that is adding an element to a case that can be complicated. Um, look, this is a this is a homicide. I mean, this is a murder case. Um, the government's taking it seriously. Um, I think the I think adding the hate crime aspect to it, there might be that element to it, but it also seems to me like this is the kind of case where I don't see the necessarily the government taking on that additional evidentiary hurdle. Because I'm not sure it would make a, I'm not sure it would make a difference in terms in of the, the outcome of the case. A lot of times, yeah. what you see with hate crime prosecutions is where you see, and traditionally, this is much more, hopefully, but more of the past, where you think that the local prosecutors or you know maybe dropped the ball or didn't take it seriously, and then the federal government comes in and they basically have a second chance to come in and you know treat it the way that you know 
the government or the public thinks it should have been treated in the first place. Okay. Here, at least all things considered, it looks like everyone's taking this pretty seriously as they should. Already. Right. Absolutely. So the football player's attorney uh, said this to the judge uh, in this last appearance the cameras were not allowed in the courtroom, um, but of course, reporters were allowed to take notes. Um, the attorney for Ismaime said, quote, I've tried more than 100 murder cases in my lifetime, and normally I don't even ask for bail. Um, however, if there's ever been a time for someone to be considered for bail, this is it. I think he was trying to explain to the judge that these were very special circumstances, that this is not a generally violent individual that might be better served being outside of the jail system, which is interesting. As I was watching the news reports on this, it seemed like the judge went ahead and granted this, but then the prosecutor said, hey, wait a minute, this is not okay. And then they went back and they added more conditions to this. Um, you know, and, and sometimes when you have, and you do see this, you see this in like communities where you have very prominent sports teams, they take on a larger than life um, kind of presentation, if you will, in all aspects of community, even in the courtroom. Because during this hearing, Ismeme's mates from the football team were there with his jer- with their jerseys on in the courtroom. And you also had Jerry, the victim, his family in the courtroom. So you can just see all of this coming together in the courtroom and a lot of pressure coming from the community from two very different sides. So what ended up happening is that Ismeme was granted $75,000 secured bond, which stipulates he must remain under house arrest. He's going to have an one of those electronic monitors, and he's going to go and be in his parents' home in Virginia Beach. Does that seem appropriate for this case? These decisions are really hard for the judges um, because they are trying to balance, as you say, all these different factors. And one of the big concerns is going to be making sure that the defendant doesn't commit any other crime or hurt anyone while on bond. Because that's that's really, you know, I think first and foremost, the, the big the, the number one concern. Um, this doesn't seem like a risk of flight case. This is more making sure there's no further danger to the community. So here and again, it may well be that the government and the defense attorney presented additional information to the judge kind of about the circumstances. What we hear so far is that, you know, this is different from at least some, you know, you, you can compare this case to kind of worse cases, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. This is a case where at least it sounds like he didn't recall the police about what happened, but it sounds like he confessed pretty quickly. And it sounds like he's admitted everything he did. And it sounds like there, there sounds like there's a lot of agreement already on the big core basic facts of the case. This puts this very different than the case we were talking about earlier, where that person was clearly, you know, being giving vague answers, lying, lying, lying to the point where, you know, she is no credibility. And there was the additional danger potentially posed by her because she went on and did other things. Um, so here. Because of the circumstances of the case, I think what the defense attorney is trying to argue, and I assume this is what he tried arguing to the judge, look, he admitted what he did. We're not disputing it. There are very, is very specific circumstances that led to this happening. These circumstances are not going to happen again, you know, given if he's under house arrest, if he's not had, does not allow to leave the home, if he's under the control of his parents, you know, the opportunity for to commit any additional harm to anyone is is minimized and taken care of. And that's why he can be a bond condition. Now, and again, that's different. That does position him differently than other defendants. When you have a defendant who's accused of a serious crime, but isn't admitting he did it, well, you know, that's, that's fine. That's his constitutional right. But, you know, you have a little bit more doubt, right, as to what this guy's going to, you know, what might happen out, out there. But again, given the circumstances, this does strike me as an unusual bond situation. I think it was a hard call for the judge. Um, you know, but I think, you know, the house arrest, the specific circumstance here is not an unreasonable decision. OK, so also Ismeme did make a statement and he did it through his attorney in conversation with his attorney in the courtroom. And he said, quote, I'm truly sorry for my actions and I feel like I've let a lot of people down. 
So sounds like he's taking even more responsibility there in a public form, one beyond what he may have said to the police. On June 2nd, Virginia Tech announced that he was suspended from the football team and the university has placed him on interim suspension. That is just one tough case, just one really tragic, tragic case. So we will keep an eye on that one as well. It is time for our comments section. Oh, and Michael is here. He's always watching your comments on our website, on YouTube, all social media. What have you got for us today, Owen? Hi, Anna. Hi, Stephen. Good to see you guys. Uh, this week, we've got uh, a Georgia story. We've got a 43-year-old Georgia woman who was arrested earlier this month after her mother's body was found in a grave in her backyard. Melissa Lockhart said she found her 67-year-old mother dead in bed but she didn't contact authorities because she didn't want anyone to cut on her mother, meaning to perform an autopsy per police. Michelle W says, I don't want her body cut open, but burying her in the backyard is okay. Jake J says, didn't want anyone to cut on her mother. More like she didn't want anyone to cut them. Social security checks coming in the mailbox. Deanna S says, I feel her to an extent. How do you all know that's not what her mother wanted? Okay, we don't know what her mother wanted. I'm sure authorities will get to the bottom of that. But that is a very physical thing to do. Your mother passes, then you have to pick her up and bury her in the backyard? You know, I wouldn't do it myself, but I sort of can see uh, if you're like a close family or something like that, something maybe about having your uh, close relatives remains somewhere on your property, uh, you know, sentimental reasons, whatever, certainly not trying to excuse it. It does sound like, uh, there's maybe more to this story to, to, to come, uh, in our next story, we've got a Chicago woman who was uh, pulled out of her SUV in the city's Humboldt park neighborhood around 6 PM last Friday by a carjacker carjacker drove away, but saw the woman's three-year-old daughter was still in the back seat. He drove around the block and returned the, uh, the toddler unharmed, Suspect then drove away again and remains at large. KB says, ah, what a sweet carjacker. Mia P says, got to give him a little credit for being a considerate criminal. And Cassie S says, the first thing I thought about was uh, how confusing that must have been for the parent and child. I would have freaked out instantly and then probably said, thank you as my child was returned and my car drove away. That's a lot to happen in five minutes. That's very true, Cassie. Wow, that's unbelievable. I mean, it it does show that it almost feels like it's a scene from Home Alone or something because it's so weird. Like the criminal is just so odd to take the car, but then be like, oh no, 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 no. This is too dangerous. It's not right here. Here's your baby, but I'm keeping the car. It's like, you know, that's like when someone tries to take your purse and you're like, could you just leave me the keys? You know, <laughs> it's a roller coaster of emotions. Definitely. Well, it's, it's, a, it's, it was smart of him <laughs> not, right. not, and also it was smart of him because I mean, again, stealing a car is one thing kidnapping. Okay. That puts you in a di- very different league. Um, also, I will say again, my general experience has been that uh, a car theft, you know, you know, there are, lo- there's low jacks, there's things like that that can help you kind right. of track down a car. Um, the police take pretty seriously the kidnapping of a child. So um, you have a lot more government resources, you know, devoted to a situation. Uh, if, if it had, if he, if he had kept the kid, definitely. Um, he would got a lot more attention. Uh, definitely. There would otherwise. have been a lot of heat on that. And by the way, Stephen, is that still considered, I suppose uh, in the abstract here, if he, if this person is arrested and they show up in court and prosecutors do want to say you endangered the, the, you endangered the safety of this child, I suppose it would be up to the prosecutor or is that sort of an automatic charge? Like an attempted kidnapping, you're saying? Sure. I think if he didn't know the kid was in the back, uh, which it sounds like was the case, then mm-hmm. I think it, it, I don't see, it would be unlikely, I think, that a prosecutor would charge him with a, an attempted kidnapping. Gotcha. Um, it's probably something that, you know, I could see a prosecutor mentioning uh, in terms of the endangerment, in terms of a, sen- you know, in terms of a, a factor that might affect the ultimate sentence. Uh, but I can see then the defense attorney saying, well, yeah, but it was only for a few minutes because you returned the child. So um, it's, I don't see it as necessarily a crime, but I see it definitely as a factor in the, mm-hmm. in the end of the case for, in terms of outcome, assuming they ever catch this guy. Oh, Owen, Owen, Owen. Can't wait to see how many more comments we have on these. There's always something. <laughs> there is. Thanks, Owen. We'll see you next week. Bye, guys.
Well, that's our program for today. Stephen, it's been such a pleasure. I love your background because usually we have criminal defense attorneys or former prosecutors from, you know, hardcore crime. And the fact that you your background is more financial, medical, I, I just love the perspective that you've brought to our cases today. So I, I hope that you come back again when we've got a case that suits you. Yeah, happy to be here. There's a lot of fun. So if people want to find out more about you or they've been like scamming the government on some checks that they shouldn't have and they're looking for an attorney or they just want to follow you on social media, where can people find you? Yeah, uh, I'm, a, I'm based in Chicago. I'm a litigation partner at the law firm Benish, Freelander, Copland and Aronoff. Uh, but you generally you can find me uh both online and on social media using my full name, Stephen Chan Lee. So that's probably the best way to find me. Terrific. I know. Uh, I found you on LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. I just, I, I love the idea of finding people who have different perspectives on all aspects of crime and making our conversation that much more diverse and just really giving you a big picture of what's going on in the world of crime. So thank you. It's been a pleasure. As always, you can find me at Anna G News, Anna with one N. Also, I want to remind everyone, uh, those of you who um, really weighed in on last week's episode on the little 13-year-old girl, Charlie Funes, who was bullied in the gymnasium by a school bully, uh, there's a great write-up in the Daily Mail about our podcast and all of you. So I hope that if you didn't see it, you get a chance to watch that podcast or read the write-up. We really appreciate your comments. They were so heartfelt. I was very deeply touched by so many of you sharing accounts of what had happened to you in your life and how hard it is and your compassion for this little girl. Okay, you can always find our content wherever you get your podcast, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Google Podcasts, of course. And you can watch us on YouTube. Subscribe to our channel. We're four and a half million strong. We really appreciate your support. Get updates to our newsletter, which Owen will write for you personally. And you can get that at truecrimedaily.com. And until then, until our next episode, I'm Anna Garcia, your host. This is True Crime Daily, the podcast. And as we always say, don't do crime.